All right, well, let's get started. We're on page 49. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning and the strength you give us. You are a constant help, a constant source of, uh, of hope. Father, I pray that you get glory for yourself and for your Son out of the things that are said here this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, we've talked about the Son of God coming for the glory of God. We've talked about Him coming for the, uh, for the joy that was set before Him. And now we're going to talk about Him coming and offering His life as a sacrifice for the joy of gaining a redeemed people. I want to read from the paragraph that I wrote here in the introduction. Thus far we've learned that God the Father loves His Son above all and has ordained all things for His glory and good pleasure. Thus before the foundation of the world, God ordained to save a people out of the multitude of sinful humanity that they might be for the glory, honor, and praise of His Son. In accordance with the will of the Father and in view of this joy set before Him, the joy of redeeming a people of His very own, the Son willingly, even joyfully, endured all for His bride and for the joy that she would ultimately bring Him. Through His incarnation and death, He has secured a great congregation for Himself from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. He has made them to be a source of continuous joy, satisfaction, and glory throughout all of eternity. Now, I want us just to think about a few things. Christianity, to say the least, is marginalized in our country. Um, usually when the media has anything to do with Christianity, it, it sets forth a Christianity that we would not even identify with and lampoons it, um, puts before the American people a, uh, a false view of what Christianity really is. And there are a lot of characters out there, specifically among the TV evangelists, that present a wrong view of Christianity. So Christianity is marginalized, and people think, even believers, that it is a small little thing going on in the earth. That is not true. If you add up the redeemed from every tribe, every nation, every people, walking on this earth right now, you'll see that Christianity is the biggest thing going. It's the biggest thing going. God has not done this in a corner. He's not done it in a box. It's not some little thing He's going to give to His Son. It is a massive, redemptive work. And one day, when it is revealed at His coming, people will literally, the unbelieving and believing alike, will be amazed at the magnitude of the work. Don't you ever think that Christianity is comprised of some little sectarian group somewhere in Alabama. It is huge. It is huge. Also, I, I want us to look at that He endured all for His bride and for the joy that she would ultimately bring Him. He is so patient in His working. And that is seen in our sanctification not being instantaneous, but that He is working and working patiently throughout the years of your life, patiently from generation to generation to eventually make His bride a spectacle of joy unto Him. I think for those of us who are husbands, this is an amazing rebuke. That Christ loves His bride in her unsanctified state. He loved her even in her unjustified state. He loved her before she was. He loved her when she was an enemy. He loves her now as an imperfect bride. 
that He is sanctifying and changing. That ought to share, tell you something about the way you ought to love your wife. Extremely important. Also, for those of us who are husbands, if you feel like your wife does not love you as she ought to, it's your fault. Remember what the Bible says. We love Christ because He loved us first. So, it is the man's love towards his wife. Now, I want to, to make it clear, we're talking about in, the, in a common marriage, in a marriage where you're just struggling with the common problems. We're not talking about believers being left by unbelievers and so on and so forth. There are impossible people. But in our common ongoing marriages that we have that are sound and strong but lacking, you should know this. The husband needs to take the upper hand. Our love ought to be the thing that produces love in our wives. Because Christ loved us. And because of that, we love Him now. Now, He has also made them to be a source of continuous joy, satisfaction, and glory throughout all of eternity. Now, this is not because of something inherent in them, as I've said. It's because they have become His work. His workmanship. You see. Now, Charles Spurgeon writes, To bring his chosen to eternal happiness was the high ambition which inspired him and made him wade through a sea of blood. Only Spurgeon made him wade through a sea of blood to get his redeemed. And it's his high ambition which inspired him. Now, do you honestly think one with such a high ambition who has already gone to such great cost is going to lose one of his? When what you need to understand is that when you see salvation as a reward for some work you've done, then it makes common sense. It is common sense to think that it can be lost. But if salvation is a work of God to demonstrate how powerful He is in saving wicked men, you understand He is not going to lose one that He has saved because it is His reputation and His name that is riding upon it. I'll read this one more time. And made him wade through a sea of blood. I read it simply because it's worthy of being read. It was not tiny drops of blood, but a sea of blood through which he had to wade. And not just the anguish caused by the abuse of men, but more so the anguish caused by the condemnation, the judgment of his father against him. Matthew Henry writes, The salvation of souls is a great satisfaction to the Lord Jesus. He will reckon all His pains well bestowed and Himself abundantly recompensed if the many sons be by Him brought through grace to glory. Let Him have this, and He has enough. God will be glorified. Penitent believers will be justified. And then Christ will be satisfied. You've heard the story about the two Moravian young men who on their, sold themselves into slavery so that they could go to an island where there were only slaves and witness to them. There was no turning back. It wasn't going to be furlough. There was no, I'll come back if I don't like it. They sold themselves to a slave owner so that they could go witness to the slaves that he owned for life. And as they were pulling away from the dock on that boat, and their parents and the church family and everything standing there looking at them. One of them screamed and said, Shall not the Lamb have the full reward of His suffering? Now that's missions. They counted their life as worthless so that the Lamb might have the full reward of his sufferings. Gentlemen, don't waste your life playing stupid little games. 
Just don't do it. Now these were two young men, barely out of their teens. I mean, join them. Join them. And I'll tell you this right now. Some of you need to get out of Facebook. You need to get off all offline. He's quit playing with people and talking and writing little things like you were a little girl. You need to become a man and you need to start doing things that men of God do. This is very important. 